Welcome to the program. I am joined by Senator Tom Cotton, the Republican from Arkansas. Always good to sit down with you. Good to be with you, Robbie. All right, and happy post Memorial Day. Yeah. Do you, do you have a good a, one? I did. Uh, I was at Boy State and Girl State, which is always a refreshing time to be around such bright, eager, uh, and inspiring 17 year olds. And uh, last week I got a chance to visit. Arlington National Cemetery where I once served and uh, see some old friends and friends of friends in Section 60 where uh, the killed from Iraq and Afghanistan are buried. So wow. it was a nice time. Sobering time and idealistic time as well. Sobering so. time, remi reminder of the sacrifices that some Americans have to make uh, and the best way to honor their sacrifice is to remember how they lived and to try to emulate the way they lived. We are going to play a game today. You and I normally just sit around and banter back and forth with some pretty tough questions, and there'll be some of that in here, but we're going to play a game called Read and React. So we're going to talk about a bunch of topics making the news right now. You up for a game? Sure. Always. What are the stakes? Uh, <laughs> well, how about steak for the stakes? How about that? So we'll see how well you do. All right. The Senate Intelligence Committees, obviously, which you sit on, has been... Um, uh, wading into all things kind of Trump and Russia and what's going on. Uh, recently, just at last week, Senator Richard Burr, Senator Mark Warner issue a letter asking for all of the campaign related correspondence from the Trump campaign. Here's what Senator Burr said. The Russians are aggressively, even today, monkeying with data off of voter files and political candidates. My question to you is your reaction to that statement and will you push for tougher sanctions on Russia when you get back. Richard Burr is 100% right. Mark Warner supports him, as do I. Um, for years, I've been trying to draw the attention of my colleagues to Russia's malign actions against U.S. interests. In fact, about 18 months ago, I wrote a very long article in Foreign Affairs calling for a whole host of sanctions against Russia, not just economic sanctions or security actions like supplying defensive weapons to Ukraine, but things like investigating their bid for the World Cup in 2018 and whether or not it was greased with bribes and kickbacks, as I suspect it was. Russia is not our friend, and I'm glad that the Democrats in Washington have finally come around to see, th see things that way after eight years of President Obama conciliating with Russia and appeasing Vladimir Putin. So what will happen when you go back? What, what sanctions, what actions will take place? Well, I continue to advocate for things like supplying Ukraine defensive weapons or drawing a firmer line against Russia's allies in the Middle East, like Iran and Syria. Uh, and again, I would encourage the Trump administration, as I encourage the Obama administration to no avail, to use all the powers they have to try to expose Russia's malign activities against U.S. interests. All right, another uh, topic that's big in the uh, news right now is you've got the Jared Kushner story as reported by the Washington Post. There's been some reaction to that from uh, White House officials as well as others in Washington, D.C. Here's what Homeland Security Secretary John Kelly said about this uh, potential or alleged kind of back channel of communications that was uh, at least um, approached. I don't see any big issue here relative to Jared. Senator John McCain, I don't think it's standard procedure prior to the inauguration of the President of the United States by someone who is not in an appointed position. Is it a big issue? Is it standard procedure? What is it to you? Well, Roby, let me say that there's a lot of back and forth in the media, uh, most recently about Jared Kushner and the meetings he had uh, during the transition with the Russian ambassador. He said, she said, oftentimes based on double or even triple hearsay. And I'm simply not going to speculate about what anonymous sources say in the news, especially when I know that certain stories are simply false. Uh, I have been briefed on certain matters in the Intelligence Committee. I can't discuss them here, but I can say that some of the stories I've read in the, new, in the news are simply false. That doesn't mean that all of them are, but that means that sources are using reporters to advance their own agenda. Sometimes it doesn't even reflect poorly on Donald Trump. It just undermines our national security, like the leaks uh, in recent weeks of intelligence shared by the United Kingdom with U.S. Right. intelligence officials related to the Manchester bombing. As it relates to meetings during a transition, it's perfectly appropriate for any incoming administration to have meetings with foreign ambassadors or foreign ministers. I can tell you that I meet regularly with foreign ministers and defense ministers and heads of states who pass through Washington and with ambassadors, probably less than ambassadors would like because we get so many requests. So it's perfectly appropriate for that to happen. It happens in every transition. Because you have to remember that for every country in the world, the most important relationship they have is with the United States. So of course they want to develop 
a relationship with the incoming president-elect and his team. Again. But beyond that, I'm not going to comment about, again, the anonymous source stories in the news about what may or may not have transpired in those meetings. I simply don't know. So you're not going to offer me any comment on the allegation that if he set something up to bypass U.S. intelligence communications, I just, I'm not going to speculate about the claims uh, that you read in the news media on anonymous source stories. So if it becomes non-anonymous, you're going to comment well, Mr. on it. Mr. Kushner has said from the beginning of the Senate Intelligence Committee's probe that he wants to cooperate, that he will come meet with our uh, um, staff to have an interview that will turn over documents upon request. He said the same thing about the probe that Special Counsel Bob Mueller uh, has started now. So I think that's a good thing. He'll be able to share his side of the story and we can evaluate it at that time. All right, let's move to the first foreign trip by President Trump. You put out a statement after the, you put out two statements actually after the first leg of the trip in Saudi Arabia. I'm quoting Tom Cotton here. For eight long years, old friends and partners in the Middle East wondered if America had abandoned them in favor of Iran. No more. The reaction out of Iran is this has been theatrical, ga theatrical gathering. What do you think is going on as a result of this uh, foreign trip, at least in Saudi Arabia, Iran, and, and in the Middle East? Well, I think the president had a very successful trip, in particular uh, in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia and Israel. He spoke to an unprecedented gathering of uh, over four dozen Arab and Islamic leaders in Saudi Arabia. He gave a very strong speech saying that the United States would once again uh, stand side by side with our traditional allies and partners, countries like Israel and Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and Egypt against Iran's uh, aggressive campaign for regional hegemony throughout the Middle East, in Yemen, in Iraq, in Syria, uh, supporting terrorist groups like Hezbollah. I can tell you from my meetings with Arab leaders from the Persian Gulf, um, they really did feel forsaken during the Obama era. It's not surprising since Barack Obama openly said that they needed to learn to share the Middle East with Iran. He called for a cold peace there. He labeled a lot of them as freeloaders. Uh, and they were very relieved that President Trump is once again siding with our traditional allies against e extremist uh, forms of Islam, uh, in, no matter what form it takes, whether it's Iran or ISIS and Al-Qaeda. You were uh, silent on the second half of the trip in terms of any prepared statements that came out. Uh, no commentary on the president's performance at NATO, so I want to get your uh, position on that. He did seem to leave some NATO members questioning American reliability. Germany's uh, Angela Merkel says, we Europeans must really take our destiny into our own hands. The times in which we can fully count on others are somewhat over as I've experienced in the past few days. Isn't a lack of confidence in NATO what the Russians would like to see and did Trump not play into their hands in that? Well, Robbie, uh, the president had said during the campaign some things about NATO that I wouldn't have said. Uh, but since he's taken office, he has said that NATO is essential to our security, that we support NATO. He simply asked all of NATO's leaders, to include Ch Chancellor Merkel above all, to contribute the money that they should for our common defense. Mm -hmm. Because Europe is not contributing the money that they've all committed, we're something like $115 billion short every year in our common defense against threats like from countries like Russia. Um, so I think it's an important part of leadership to go speak to friends and speak candidly and frankly to them and demand that they carry their share of the load as well. I think it's regrettable that Chancellor Merkel at a campaign event in the middle of her own campaign would pander to public opinion, not just against the United States, but against the United Kingdom as well, uh, since the British people voted to leave the European Union last year and something that she opposed. The US-UK-German alliance is much stronger than that. Should it had been a public shaming of sorts, or should it have been something done in, in private? In we, terms all have, of those, we, those all, we all know this disagreement. Uh, during the Cold War, uh, Europe and North America split the NATO cost about 50-50. We now spend about 70% of all of NATO's defense spending. Europe spends 30%. John McCain and Barack Obama and other leaders in both parties have long called for this. I think Donald Trump is simply calling a spade a spade and saying to these leaders, you need to do more to carry your share of the load. As Jim Mattis said, earlier this year. We can't care, care more about your kids and their future than you care about your own kids and their future. Yep. All right, let's take a quick commercial break. We're going to talk about some domestic stuff when we come back. Senator Tom Cotton, more with him right after this. Arkansas Electric Cooperative Corporation provides electric energy across two-thirds of Arkansas. This is an exciting time in our energy history, with incredible progress being made in renewable energy and storage technologies. As our energy portfolio continues to diversify, 
we'll maintain an all the above strategy to provide reliable and affordable electricity. Ever since the first light bulbs were placed in our members' homes, the electric cooperatives have been the solutions provider for our members, and we want to continue that well into the future. Each day, the promise of our nation begins again. Arkansas and America moving forward. I help make that promise a reality. It's not for everyone, but people everywhere depend on us. Oh, I love you too, Trucking delivers or everything stops. And that's what drives me. Welcome back to the program. I'm with Senator Tom Cotton. We're talking to a lot of domestic and international affairs here. Let's move to the domestic side of things here. Lost in kind of the whole president's uh, trip uh, abroad, he submitted a budget that strengthens military spending, advocates for some tax cuts, also advocates for some spending cuts in uh, agricultural programs, Medicaid, uh, disability uh, in terms of Social Security, some things that would impact Arkansas in a pretty major way. Senator Lindsey Graham says this, the budget proposed by the president doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell of passing. So my question to you is, do you agree with Senator Graham? Well, I believe uh, you could probably say that about most presidents uh, and most of their budgets going back decades. Um, you know, it's Congress's job to write the budget and to spend taxpayer dollars in what we think is the wisest and most effective way. So as is usually the case, uh, there are some parts of the president's budget uh, that I like and I think would be good for Arkansas and our interests. You know, as you say, defense spending is up. It's not up nearly enough uh, of what it should be. Uh, there are some important reforms to welfare programs like food stamps and disability uh, that would encourage people to get back to work, give them the training uh, and the assistance they need to help find a job to get back to work. There's other parts of the budget, though, that I can't imagine will pass the Congress, like cuts to basic medical and scientific research. Those are not really what drives our national debt, uh, and they actually pay pretty big dividends in the long run. So we'll, we'll, t we'll take the President's budget request into consideration, of course, but ultimately it's Congress that write writes the budget and spends taxpayer dollars. Give me one specific item that you are going to make sure does not get approved in the President's budget that would have a negative impact on Arkansas. Oh, uh, I can't say that I've gotten into the specific line item details uh, enough just yet since I've been back home the last few days. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunities in every department uh, to tighten the belt uh, and make sure that uh, agencies and departments are spending taxpayer dollars wisely. We see that a lot in the Department of Defense because it's such a large budget uh, and there are so many instances of um, spending that just wasn't done well, that didn't deliver a sound product. But you can find that anywhere else as well, the Department of State, the Department of Commerce, the Department of Agriculture. We want to make sure that the money we spend for public purposes has the biggest impact on end users, on that soldier on the battlefield or the farmer in East Arkansas or the forester in South Arkansas, not on a bureaucrat or some you know, headquarters uh, office in Washington, D.C. All right, let's talk about Cuba. This is an anonymous report, so you may not want to comment on this or you may want to declare it fake news, but there are reports circulating that Donald Trump is going to reverse uh, his posi uh, Obama's position on Cuba uh, and change some of the travel restrictions, some of the trade restrictions that we have seen somewhat loosen up. You and I have talked about Cuba a lot. Senator Marco Rubio says this, Trump will treat Cuba like the dictatorship that it is. What does that mean to you? Well, I'm not sure what Senator Rubio means exactly by that, but I do know that the president, his administration is undertaking a review of our Cuba policy. You know, speaking of back channels as we were earlier, uh, the current Cuba policy was determined by one of President Obama's speechwriters uh, in secret negotiations in Canada with Cuban intelligence officers. And when you put a speechwriter up against an intelligence officer, it shouldn't be surprising that the country that sent intelligence officers gets the better end of the deal. Uh, what I worry about is that Cuba is still an adversarial nation uh, to the United States, and in particular its intelligence activities uh, in the United States and throughout the Western Hemisphere uh, are designed to undermine our interest. And the way our relationship with Cuba is uh, arranged now, that means most of the dollars uh, that they're getting from us are going straight into their government, which is a police and security state. So until we can address that challenge that Cuba poses to us, uh, I think a review and a change of the Obama policy is appropriate. Are you advocating for that review? Have you been active in advocating for change in no, Cuba I've, policy? I haven't spoken to the president about it. I know that his administration is undertaking it, given what bad terms President Obama got for that deal with Cuba. I think it's appropriate for President Trump to review it. And again, a lot of these details I, I can't discuss openly, um, but 
Cuba is not our friend. Uh, and along with countries like Russia and China, they pose one of the most serious intelligence threats that our country faces. All right, last subject for you. Let's talk, uh, let's end with health care reform because you are part of a uh, coalition in the Senate that's going to be working on a potential outcome um, based off of what the House has passed and sent over here. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, quote, I don't know how we get to 50 votes at the moment, but that's the goal. What happens if you don't get to 50 votes in the well, Senate? Does this have electoral consequences for well, Republicans? Mitch is, a, Mitch is a pretty good vote counter in the Senate. Uh, so if he says that, I would suspect that's where we are right now. And just based on my assessment, that's where we are. There's a lot of very productive and constructive ongoing conversations occurring about the nature of the Medicaid expansion and reforming Medicaid in the long run to bring down costs while still delivering quality care and how you fix the individual insurance market. You know, not many Arkansans get insurance to that market, but the ones who do oftentimes tend to have more serious health problems. So it's something that I'm focused on as well. Um, I think we can coalesce around a solution that'll ultimately get 50 votes and that will improve our health care system. It'll certainly be an improvement over Obamacare um, because Obamacare is not getting any better. It's continuing to collapse. Rates are continuing to go up. Insurers are continuing to pull out. So that's why the Senate is focused on doing this right. We're not trying to rush things through. We're not operating on shortened uh, timelines or artificial deadlines. We're trying to make sure that we get health care reform right. Tell me a little bit more. Let's explore that Medicaid expansion subject. That's obviously been uh, a big part of health care reform in Arkansas. Yeah. What are you advocating to keep in place? What are you advocating needs to change in terms of Medicaid expansion and well, that, specifically how it impacts Well, Arkansas? I think in the, in, in the long run, uh, Medicaid should be transformed into a system where our governors and legislatures have uh, a lot more flexibility and discretion to design uh, the system that works for our states. You know, Arkansas is a very different state from, say, California or Oregon, and our governor and our legislature should be able to design a health care system that works for our population. You know, just a couple weeks ago, they had a special session that moved about 60,000 people off of the Medicaid rolls and into private insurance. We'd like to give them more flexibility and more discretion to, say, have small copayment requirements or adjust income levels to reflect economic and health care realities in Arkansas. We'd also like to make sure that other states that spend way more than we do on Medicaid are not continuing to be a drain on taxpayer dollars from Arkansas. Ultimately, our goal should be to get most able-bodied adults off of Medicaid and into a job or into the individual market so Medicaid can continue to pr provide the role that it did before Obamacare, which is supporting the elderly and the disabled and the severely poor. All right, we're going to wrap it up there, but with one final question there that's not a read and react question. You were in Iowa recently, I think, you know, there was all kinds of buzz about you being in Iowa. You got any other out-of-state trips planned anytime soon? I mean, I hear that New Hampshire and South Carolina are looking for uh, dinner speakers up there. No, no, nothing planned up there anytime soon. I am going to Chicago to speak to David Axelrod's Institute of Politics at University of Chicago and, and do his podcast. I'll look forward to that. Uh, David's obviously on the other side of the aisle, but a very smart observer of politics uh, and a very decent man. Yeah, when is that? It's Friday. Oh, all right. Well, we'll be tuning in on that. Try not yeah. to make too much news. All right, Senator Cotton, <laughs> right. always good to be Thanks, with Robbie. you. Thanks yeah. so much. Thank you for tuning in. That's all for today's program. We'll see you next time.